Blog Talk Radio. exactly is happening, but it seems like we started out with a problem, and I think it may be on the end. It started probably at Blog Talk Radio, because for some reason, they weren't playing the intro to the show, etc., etc., etc. And somehow it starts. Okay, folks, let's do this one more time. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am Egberto Willis, your host. Sorry for how this program began, but the reality is I haven't a clue what went wrong. It seems like Blog Talk Radio had some technical difficulties unbeknownst to me. But you know what? Who cares? We're getting started with what's going to be a very good show. And why is it going to be a very good show? Because you are here. So um, let me first get started with, um, with what, why we were not live last week. Last week, Coffee Party board members all met in Boulder, Colorado. We sat there and locked to ourselves. Well, uh, at first when we got there, we met with uh, the Denver um, folks in um, in Denver, Colorado, and spoke to that the coffee party group in Denver and, you know, told them and explained to them and got some input from them as far as where we were going and where we should be going. So we had a whole lot of very good, frank, honest, and very fruitful conversations. Um, I wrote a blog piece about what uh where we're going and you know what i wasn't going to read it but because of the start that we had i think i better get my thoughts together and read it out for you and here it goes coffee party usa board members are required to meet and then we'll get into the subject folks for i know a lot of you are listening in and calling in for that subject on the obama deranged syndrome and war but we'll get to that but please bear with me let's take care of some coffee party uh usa business Coffee Party USA board members are required to meet in person once a year. This year, Coffee Party USA held its yearly in-person board meeting in Boulder, Colorado. Whenever one tries to uh, herd seven or 12 board members in one place, 
Something always goes wrong. This time was no different. Janine Loudon, Devlin Molyneux, and Egberto Willis arrived before noon on Thursday. They had lunch and then checked into the home rented to the ret- for the retreat. After discussing Coffee Party USA history for a few hours, it was time to visit the Coffee Party USA Denver uh, group. Coffee Party Denver, Nicola Casewood invited the group to the meeting. Many questions were asked and answered about many Coffee Party USA events, grievances, and actions. The meeting went extremely well and ended with hugs, back slaps, you name it, we had fun. Steve Justino, one of the Move to, uh, of Move to a Men, also attended the meeting. He was interested in collaborating with Coffee Party USA to use it outreach, use it to reach on Supreme Court actions. Board of Directors uh, Billy Sears and Vince Lamb missed their planes, and of course, our our good buddy Cameron uh, Michaels was unable to attend, but he came via virtual uh, uh, Google Hangout as well to be with us. Vince Lamb was able to get a flight on, in on Friday. Billy Sears was unable to. Director Tanya Jefferson was unable to include um, flying in her schedule, but as usual, they were all with us virtually, cameras in tow, so we still got to have a strong board meeting with most people in, in Colorado and a few having to stay on the East Coast and the Midwest. On Friday, Directors Janine Loudon and Tim Dennehy attended the National Conference on Food in Colorado Springs. Janine represented Coffee Party USA, where she enrolled new members and sold several Coffee Party USA memorabilia. That was pretty cool, according to Tim Tim Dennehy. Attending this, Tim Dennehy said the following, attending this event allowed the Coffee Party to establish working relationships with large national organizations like the Humane Society of the United States, the Organization for Competitive Markets, Food and Water Watch, the American Antitrust Institute, and others. The effort will continue this weekend as I attend the Public Banking Institute Conference in Santa Fe and later in, in October. That's a pretty darn good group. I met those guys at, at um, the Democracy Convention in Madison, Wisconsin. The outreach continues along the East Coast. The organizations are becoming aware of the Coffee Party and value our principles as they apply to their causes. They all support our efforts to bring issues forward in civil engagement and develop active citizens. It is the hope of these organizations to allow Coffee Party members to learn about their issues and mobilize in constructive ways. I believe the Coffee Party membership will be given opportunities to use our principles to encourage citizens to participate in causes important to membership. We will report all our efforts to membership, and as individuals, we'll, we wish will pave the way to participation. It will be exciting. Janine Loudon said the following about the same event. I assisted the board member, Tim Dennehy, as he moderated the conference on Friday, September 19th. The lineup of national leaders from uh, diverse aspects of good food movement and, the sp- and spoke strongly about the cost of, failed exper- of the failed experiment of international industrial agriculture. The strategies to support local and family-owned farms and ranches and calling for unity with one another and other organizations interested in supporting the will of the people. We represented Coffee Party USA as good government partner wherever and whenever the elected failed to represent their constituents in favor of the interests of big campaign donors. The Coffee Party was an outreach and media partner for this event. Though the Coffee Party board had different activities on Thursdays and Friday, many sub-dialogues were taking place that all came together on Saturday. The Coffee Party USA board set a new direction based on the results of a survey of our members and on ideas new and recycled. Constant information will be provided to our members via our new newsletter and forthcoming email blast. In short, we will be reactivating Free the Elected, Be the media. You guys know that you are all the media now. We cannot trust what's called the media today. So you are the media. And, of course, Project 435, where we'll have people in every single congressional district in this country. We will be teaming up with several organizations to leverage our synergies. Several contacts with several organizations were already made by Janine in Colorado Springs. 
Develin and Janine will be participating in several transpartisan events in Washington, D.C. in October. Specifically, on October 15th, Coffee Party USA President Develin Malino is co-facilitating and board member Janine Loudon will attend a conference of organizations working on criminal justice reform to discuss better collaboration and explore the options for legislative reform. Organizations that will be represented included include foundations, faith groups, advocacy groups, political consultants, and more. Specific areas of reform and civil assets, forfeiture, offender, risk assessment to implement evidence-based practices and smarter sentences. Other areas may emerge, such as mental ill health and substance abuse, treatment and racial equality, or I should say inequality. On October 16, they will attend a day-long meeting of collaborative leaders and organizations to explore more possibilities of working together. People in this group may refer to their work as bipartisan, cross-partisan, transpartisanship, or in however they, refer, they do it, whatever language is used, the focus is supporting our government to work again, moving past this era of congressional gridlock. Representatives from political reform groups, philanthropic uh, organizations, think tanks, and advocacy groups are attending. Coffee Party USA President Devlin Melodo is co-facilitating that one as well. October 17th through 19th, Coffee Party USA board member Janine Loudon will represent Coffee Party while President uh, uh, Melanie uh, Devlin Malino will be working with many organizations during the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation three-day conference. Dialogue and facilitator professionals will share what is working from around the country. Coffee Party USA will participate in the showcase of Friday evening and host a table to talk about dialogue as activism during a Saturday plenary session. The 2014 Coffee Party Board Meeting was the most substantive board meeting to date, and folks have been to all of them. Our new president, Devlin Melano, ends the following prophetic statement that we will intend to make true. She said, There is something synergistic about having the right people in the right place at the right time that really feels like it is going to propel us into the future. We are going to take off. Folks, go to the uh, website. Uh, it's on my website, uh, EgbertoWillies.com. And, of course, it's at CoffeePartyUSA.com. Uh, I still have to get that place correctly for easier access, but we haven't decided how that's going to be done yet. So this blog is at the website, and it also includes videos of not only discussion of us doing some planning and, and activities that we did in Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado, but it also includes a statement from each of the board of directors or from most of the board of directors, we couldn't get all of them uh, in the video at this time. We'll probably add those a bit later uh, with where uh, we are intending to take the coffee party under the direction of our members and with suggestion from our, suggestions from our members. So please go ahead and check that out. If you go to the blog post for this, for, for this show, it's also in there. So what is this show about today? And if you have questions about any of this, feel free to uh, call in and talk again. The number is 646-929-2495. Again, that number is 646-929-2495. This is a call-in show, and I'd love to hear from you guys. want to hear what you're thinking. Now that I got some of the Coffee Party specific business out of the way, I hope, first of all, you go to coffeepartyusa.com and be a part of us, be a member, join up, there's a whole lot of stuff that we have going forward. We want you. We need you. Your country needs you. Okay, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, today is going to be an interesting case, an interesting st story. I titled it, and it wasn't what I was intended to speak about today, but after watching it on Rachel Maddo, I thought I needed to do a little talking about it because I think it hurts us all. But the title is War and the Obama derangement syndrome. This is important, folks. To be clear, I completely disagree with President Obama going to war with ISIS, ISIL, or whatever you want to call these folks. Uh, in fact, I believe we have been conned into war, and I have written several blog posts about that. And I, within this post, I click several. Uh, I list 
uh, links to several of the blog posts that I wrote on this. And, you know, it's not just what I'm saying. It's what many other people are saying, what many other people are insinuating as well. We do not belong in another war. There are many other avenues that could have been taken. Going forward, everyone who disagree with President Obama's actions should speak out against it and try to force our politicians to do what is right. Just like many of us spoke out against President Bush's illegal war in Iraq, we must speak out against this unnecessary war. And let me get out of the blog piece for a while. I don't want to sound callous by saying unnecessary war. After watching the vile nature, the violent surveillance that is promoted by ISIS, ISIL. It is terrible. It is violent. It is bad. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. That said, America is one nation. Most on the right, the left, the middle, gave President Bush legitimacy the world needed to see, even in disagreement. Unfortunately, President Obama is unable to get this legitimacy from the other side. What is ironic is that President Obama has acquiesced to the military-industrial complex. The president has acquiesced to the neocons. The president has acquiesced to the Republicans. So why cannot, why can he not get the needed support overtly? This is the Obama derangement syndrome in action. It throws rational thought out the door. GOP Congressman Doug Lambert, Republican of Colorado, attack on president on the president is the latest case. I want to know what's your thoughts, folks. The blog post for today, today's blog post is titled, GOP Representative Doug Lamburn is urging generals to resign in a blaze of glory to oppose the president. So I ask, in attempting to undermine a president with his generals during a war treason, let me back up, I said that wrong is attempting to undermine a president with his generals during a war treasonous in nature? GOP Representative Doug Lamburn is urging generals to resign in a blaze of glory to oppose the president in his, or to oppose the president. Is this not, is this not an unpatriotic act? First, I, I I was going to play it. I was going to play the piece, but I'm not going to play the piece. I'll just re- do the blog. GOP Congressman Doug Lambert sits on the House Armed Service Committee. He is a constant partisan critic of the president. According to the Colorado Independent, Colorado U.S. Rep. Doug Lambert said that behind said that behind the scenes. He and other Republican members of Congress were encouraging military officers to resign in protest over President Obama's foreign policy. And this is him speaking. Let me assure you on this. Lambert told a small gathering of so-called Liberty voters in Colorado Springs on Tuesday. It's funny. We left Boulder, Colorado, which is pretty darn close to Colorado Springs, just Sunday. A lot of us, otherwise I would have loved to be, if I had known he was giving a speech, I would have been out there with a camera myself. But anyhow, anyhow, a lot of us are talking to the generals behind the scenes. That's what he's saying. Hey, if you disagree with the policy that the White House has given you, let's have a resignation. You know, let's have a public resignation and state your protest and go out in a blaze of glory. I haven't seen that very much. 
In fact, I haven't seen that at all in years. So says Representative Doug Lambert. Rep. Doug Lambert was speaking to the Liberty Voters, a group of Tea Party voters. He's running against retired Air Force General Irv Halter, a conservative Democrat. General and Democrat candidate Irv Halter had a, an appropriate response to Lambert's statement. And I tell you, this was classy. I, I love the way he said it. He said the following. It is inappropriate for Congressman Lambert to politicize our military for his own gain, he said in an email. When I joined the Air Force, I swore an oath to execute policy, not make policy. All of our service members take seriously their obligation to serve our nation honorably and follow the chain of command. Our elected officials should not be encouraging our military leaders to resign when they have a disagreement over policy. Congressman Lambert's statement shows his immaturity and lack of understanding of the American Armed Forces. Someone who serves on the House Armed Services Committee should know better. It's very disconcerting to see Representative Doug Lambert publicly admit to an act to undermine the president during war. It was most disappointing, however, that he did not admonish the man who asked him the question, who referred to the president as the Muslim Brotherhood in the White House. This Obama derangement syndrome will only be stopped when those that cannot control the most vile nature of their partisanship are voted out of office. Only then can compromise occur between parties and ideas to move the country forward. You know, many folks are taken aback whenever transpartisan groups, nonpartisan groups, single-handedly uh, call out one side in our political equation, like what I'm doing here. It is a must. It is a must that all folk, whenever they see evil, whenever they see wrong, whenever they see someone that is messing with the viability of our country, with the viability of our people, with the viability of the middle class, whomever it is, whatever party it is a, it, it is a, they're a member of, it doesn't matter. It is your duty of citizenship. It is your duty of citizenship to call it out. In fact, I will wager, or not wager, but I, was, I will say one thing. One of the reasons our politics has reached the state that has, it has reached is not because of the nitpicking, fighting between folks calling, uh, calling out each other, etc. It's the lack thereof. Think about it. From the, let's just go back a, little, a few years, 2009. If someone had called out and showed how insipid and silly, in fact, nonsensical it was when folks talked about Congress folk somehow throwing grandma over the, under the bus or death panels. As silly as those things were, if they were called out and those who made those statements made as small, simple as they are, as they were. And if folks had not made those concepts even a possibility, if folks had made anybody willing to tell a lie of that nature, not only a lie, but something that made no sense, if they had been called out by the media, if they had been called out by independent writers, and I'm not talking here and there, I'm talking consistently because of how wrong it was, we would have never gotten to the point 
where folks watched that and said, wow, I can lie. I can say something that is utterly silly. I can say something that makes no sense. And you know what? Chuck Todd on NBC would talk about it. Uh, Diane Sawyer on ABC would talk about it. And for all those limited readers or those consumers of broadcast news with no further research, they'll eat it up. They'll eat it up. That is how minds get changed. That is how minds get devalued. That is how one makes something that would normally seem silly to even the, a mind that doesn't care to do much become a norm and become receptive to other idiocies. That is how it's done. And that is where we are in our country. You know, I, I watch Bill Maher uh, talk about Americans in a sort of a vile way. Last night it was pretty bad. I, I wouldn't even post it because I thought he got a whole lot of stuff uh, pretty darn wrong. But there's, there are many things that a lot of these satirists say about the American population that I think it is our fault. When I say our fault, I mean those of us that write, those of us that, that have some sort of platform, it is our right for censoring many times things that need to be said in the hope of not offending a few and the ones who pay that the price then are those, or it's not those, the ones that pay the price for all of us. And that's where we are at today. That is a fight that we have. The Obama derangement syndrome is just one of many, but it is the fight that we have. Folks, the number is 646-929-2495. Again, that number is 646-929-2495. I see many of you online here listening, but you have not pushed one to talk. I would love to hear what you have to say. For those of you online, I am about to fire up my Twitter here, which I forgot to do, but do remember that hashtag politics done right. I follow that as well, uh, and I didn't fire it up this morning, but I'm about to fire up my hashtag politics done right. So what are your thoughts? Let me first go to 313. 313, how can I help you, or what do you have to offer, my dear friend? Hi, Egberto. This is Mike up in Lansing. Hey, and, Mike. Uh, How you doing, Mike? N- not bad. Not bad. It's uh, a pretty nice day out there, and I'm going to go out and enjoy it right after we're done. Hey, uh, uh, what but, you going to uh, go do, kayaking? Uh, I'm actually going to go over to the campus of Michigan State and do a little bit of watching after the football game gets out. Uh, and I'm have... Good for you, dude. Good for you. What's up, Mike? Well, I, um, of course, I'm a veteran, and uh, and I just want to read the oath of commissioned officers here. And, uh, of course, it's I state your name. Having been appointed an officer in the Army of the United States, and this is the Army, as indicated above in the grade of whatever grade it is, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, uh, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservations or purpose uh, of an evasion, and that I will I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. And that is the oath of commissioned officers. Now, if you also remember that prior to our, or during our initial entry into Iraq, there were generals that disagreed with the, um, with then President Bush's um, decision to go into Iraq that were kind of pushed out their careers as an officer. An officer is a very political um a uh, uh, position to be held in, in any of the militaries. It's highly political. Uh, that's that was the that would be a career ender, and uh, for any of you know for any officer. And so, 
those there were a lot of generals that were and, and leaders that disagreed that were pushed aside and basically uh, forced to retire because their career was over, over with. And that is the kind of thing that, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think that Mr. Lambert, and, and I use Mr. as, um, as a, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't even be using that term because I have no respect for this man. Um, and, and some of the other things that he has done, uh, that, you know, his trying to get him to basically, uh, create a mutiny, um, uh, within the military is, uh, you know, to, to anybody who served in the military or been around the military is atrocious. Absolutely. You know, um, Mike, one one time, I wrote a you know a blog piece. I, I'm trying to remember when it was. I think it was a couple of years ago, and I had used the word treason, and a whole lot of folks got on my case. They said I didn't understand the real definition of treason. I looked it up, and in my mind, I stuck by what I said because I really thought. It wasn't. It was implicit treason. Now here, I expressed it as a question to ask people in general. If you have p- people in Congress, if you have a a president moving on foreign policy, his duty, what he is, what what the Constitution says he's supposed to be doing, and you have a whole lot of congressmen on the foreign on the foreign um, the foreign com- or, or rather on the service the armed service committee that are contacting generals asking them to resign in protest to what the president is doing while at the same time we're in war. It seems to me that you are actually putting your country at danger or in danger. It seems to me what you are saying is just because you have a disagreement with with the executive, you are going to put the entire the entire military well being of the country in danger. And my friend, I think that's a classic de- definition of treason. It's a classic. I, I looked it up. I didn't, I didn't outright call it treason on the blog post today, but I sure looked it up and I said, my God, if, if think about if some other, think if some liberal was out there. I don't care if it's a liberal Democrat or a liberal Republican. Think about a liberal doing something like this and stating it overtly and having it on, on, on tape. Think about how the news coverage would be right now. The only person that I saw carrying this live, or not live, but recently, is Rachel Maddow. And one of the reasons I wrote about it today is with the expectation that it, that's somehow it will grab on and a lot of people would see it, rewrite about it, write their side on, on it, and, and get it out there. Because what happens is most of America, when these guys are in their, their cubby holes making these statements, a lot of people are not listening. And then they wake up in the morning with these guys in office again, and they wonder, this is what we're going to have to live with for two years again and get go nowhere again. Like I said, I disagree with the president strongly on going into, um, on going into both Syria and Iraq and, and, making, and, and attempting to make ISIS, ISIL, an existential, an existential danger. It is not. And you know, yesterday, and I, I probably am going to cut that out in um, in Bill Maher's piece. Like I said, I I didn't like Bill Maher's program last night. I think it was vile. In as much as I am not a a religious person, I think he he had a very harsh attack on both Christianity and Muslim and Islam that was very uncalled for. You know, I mean, just like I am not a religious person, I respect everybody's right to a religion and I didn't like what he did but there were some Absolutely. good parts yeah. right there were some good parts of his um of his of his piece that is worth mentioning but one of the the pieces that he said is let's sort of enumerate this and and by the way I think I see Jack on online Jack I'm going to be coming to you next so please be prepared with your statement my dear friend um uh, there's one thing that he said and he he tried to map it out he said how can how can bombing them over there stop one or two or three of them from coming over here to do something. The same way 
uh, we use the term the, the same the same the same silliness that death panels has the, the that silly way of being or that silly thought death panels. Anybody that's thinking know that death panels is silly. No politician is going to create a death panel. They couldn't survive it, and it's an immoral thing. So there were never death panels. Sounded silly. That's the same way we're going to bomb them over there to prevent them from coming over here. That's the same type of silly. Because you cannot stop a single man with, a, with bombs around his belt from boarding a plane. I don't care how many bombs you drop in Syria, Iraq, Iran, or anywhere else. You can always get a couple of folks with a belt on with bombs if they really want to do it. Where you want to invest your money is in securing your space. If we took the money instead of building bombs and dropping bombs and secured our space, we don't care what else happens. Then we can concentrate on humanitarianism. Then that's when we do that. But uh, stay with me, Mike. I want to bring, uh, I want to bring uh, Jack in, and I'll come back to you, Mike. Jack... Golden, how you doing, my friend? Okay, you hear me? Yes, I can. Please make your statement, my dear friend. Okay. Uh, I just happen to disagree with you on uh, this because, I mean, I was uh, pretty much neutral on that until we got the beheadings of these people. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, this should be a war to end all wars. Jack, let me stop you a okay. second. I really, I want to stop you. Stop. I want to stop you right there. This is very important what you said, uh, and and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. Did you tell me that you would be in agreement that we shouldn't go to war until you saw the beheading of two reporters? Is that? Did I understand you correctly? Yeah, that was uh, that was it, and. Uh, Maybe uh, this was propaganda, but uh, I think that that, that uh, switched a lot of people from negative uh, to 20% for going into Syria and those places to uh, over 60%. Um, let me just, just listen to me. Uh, all right. Sure, go ahead. Uh, the idea, okay, I don't. Uh, Congress can't even agree on uh, what what they're going to do uh, with uh, in doing uh, a declaration of war. It is a it is a declaration of war in ISIS. That's going to take uh, three years to ten years to uh, get get through that. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, they said definition okay. This bears my uh, bears me out with uh, with Mike over there. That uh, definition is never a fact; it's only a matter of opinion. Uh, the, uh, the Webster's uh, or Funkin' Wagnalls is a is official opinion. A uh, definition of treason, for sure, example. Sure, Jack. I understand. I understand what you're saying, but let me hear your point because I have a couple more I need to go to. But please make your point. Okay. Your uh, point. Okay. Uh, we got a lot of more important issues to deal with. It was unnecessary. We, we go back to, uh, I call them, uh, well, the two, the two Pauls, Paul Wolfowitz and Paul Bremer. Right. Cause ISIS to occur. Yes, you're and right. We got out of the got out, got out of uh, Iraq in uh, 2004 as soon as uh, Saddam Hussein was captured. And maybe some people were saying that they actually, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I started uh, was 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 the was uh, militant group in uh, uh, Iran, Iraq, started as soon as we went into uh, Iraq in 2003. Jack. So Jack? 2001. Okay, Jack, I need to go to the other call, but let me tell you, first of all, you're right. You're absolutely right. And while everything that you see us doing right now is clean up. Now, the question that one must ask is, is this the right type of clean up? I'm going to be back with you, Jack, but let me get 412 in, and then I'll come back to you, my friend. Uh, 412, you are hot. What's, the, uh, what, what's your name, sir, or ma'am? Uh, this is Greg in Pittsburgh. How are you? 
Hey, Greg, I haven't heard from you in a while, my friend. Talk to me. I, I, I want to agree with you on a couple of things. Number one would be that it is incumbent upon uh, every citizen uh, to call out um, equivalent, false equivalencies, um, you know, outright lies, uh, misinterpretations of, of fact. Uh, I, I think that's one of the greatest challenges that exists today is that people operate – they think about, they read, and they listen to their own bubbles. And I, I'm not going to make any bones about it. They're, the conservative bubble is wrong on literally everything. Literally everything. Trickle-down economics was a lie. They want to inhibit voting uh, rights and access to the polls that people who they know will vote against. They deny climate science. I mean, the list goes on and on. So as far as I'm concerned, I really applaud and I admire all the work the Coffee Party does. But... Uh, I, uh, I guess I'm. I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, you guys need to take a stand and quit fooling around. Quit pretending that there's two voices and that there's two sides to every story. They're just okay. And can I, I can I can I stop you right there, yeah, Jack? I mean, uh, Greg. Sure, please. Here's mm -hmm. the deal. First of all, the direction of the par the coffee party is for truth. The direction of the coffee party will not be, as you just stated, to uh, try to create false equivalences. So if you think. That is the definition of the coffee party. Uh, my dear friend, you are wrong. We want guys exactly like you as well who will come out there civilly. Facts. Because remember, when you talk about the conservative bubble, you have the conservative leadership that drives that bubble. Our intent is really not to t tell somebody not to be a conservative, liberal, or whatever, but to put the truth out there and Personally, Egberto, I am going to take a position, okay? Whenever I take a position, I, I, I do it using my coffee party tenants, but I do it as myself. So in order not to, uh, we have many different views, but within this one umbrella, within the umbrella of the coffee party, Greg, is a position, a place for your thoughts, my thoughts, and everybody else's thoughts. And it is here that we want, we believe, it, it is here that we believe that we can make a difference. And why? Because our tenets allows us to talk to each other. And I can tell when a conservative says something silly, I am going to call him out civilly. I'm not going to go on a, on a soapbox, but I'm going to call him out civilly. So what I'm trying to tell you, Greg, we need your voice. Continue, my friend. Uh, okay, and I'm, you know, obviously I'm perfectly fine having a, um, a civil disagreement with people. Um, what I no longer feel compelled to do is try to convince people who are patently wrong and refuse to have a fact-based conversation. I can civilly decide to ignore them and the reason is simple. They, I, they exactly. are the, Egberto, they are the problem. Yes, Here's sir. why. It's not about the Republican politicians and the party. It's the people who vote for them that create our problems in society today. The Republican Party relies on the low-information voter. And until we call out our friends, our family, our neighbors for being low-information voters, it's unlikely anything's going to change. And if they won't change, then I'm moving on without them. They well, are you know the what, problem. Greg, I have complete agreement with your statement, 100% agreement with your statement, okay? And, I, and like I said, I think it is our – if you notice, I said before, I, I don't know if you listened to early, the, the part of the show earlier where I said it is our – not only our civic duty, but our duty right. as citizens, our citizenship right. requires that. Right. Because like I said before as well, if we had nipped things like death panels in the right. butt, if we had nipped those... In, by the way, Marianne Castiglia had some very good words for your, what you said. Thank you, Marianne. I also wish you would call in and make some of the statements because you are... I mean, Mar uh, Marianne Castiglia finds some great information that, that, that is there to do exactly what you said. Call out low-information voters, and, but do it the right way. So I'm with you, oh, yeah. I'm, Look, I, look, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in a civil and a fact-based way. Now, I, I might, I'm obviously get maybe a little emotional on the phone, and that's kind of just how my voice comes out. But I'm, I'm passionate about this notion, and it's part of the reason why I'm, I'm still hopeful that in some way the coffee party – and I'm not suggesting you get rid of transpartisanship. I just don't believe in it. 
You can't have two sides to every issue. There are not um, two solutions to every problem. No, 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 no. Uh, let me correct that. Transpartisanship does not mean two sides at all, because first of all, there are more than two parties, and we recognize that there are more than two parties. There's Republican, Democrat, Green, and a, a whole bunch of others. Secondly, Greg, right. transpartisan, uh, trans, I think, means like across, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean yes. either or. Right. So uh, right. I go, let me tell you, I live in conservative land, and one of the so most enjoyable experiences I have, exactly, one of the most ex ex enjoyable experiences I have is sitting down speaking to a whole bunch of conservatives who sit down and say, damn it, Birdo, I didn't quite look at it that way. I'll never be a Democrat, but I see what you're saying. And I want to, you know, yeah, we need to work on X, Y, Z. That's the kind of relationships that I, I want to have. I, I don't want, like you said, I'm not really trying to convince anybody. I'm just trying to inform and I'm trying to see, uh, get folks who are willing to accept information. And I'll be honest with you, Greg, I think most, the vast majority of Americans, if, if when you are approaching them, they don't think you're really in for that attack, in for that kill. I think or a lot of Americans, I've, I've, I've lived it, I've experienced it, will give you, your, give you your space. They'll give you your time to talk. I mean, they won't agree with you with everything. They'll st they still think I'm a pinko liberal, but they respect the pinko liberal, and they, 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 they adapt some of the policies from the pinko liberal, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I do. I understand exactly what you're saying, and I, I agree with it um, in principle. I'm, I was simply – maybe I wasn't doing a good job of making my point, and my point is that – No, no, you, you made the a problem, great point. The problem, well, the, prob the problems are well-defined. The solutions are eminently uh, achievable, and if, and if one half of the nation – and actually, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's not even a half. It's a minority of individuals right. who are the ones who actually show up at primaries, who actually put people like – uh, Sarah Palin and um, uh, and uh, I can't remember her name now from Delaware. Yeah, well, Michelle Bachman, yeah, Ted Cruz, um, Louis Gohmert. The people who show up at the polls are the ones right. who are putting those people in office. And in, and if we just sit on our asses and stay home and don't say anything and don't do anything and don't go vote, it's our fault. Well, shame on us. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. exactly. Let, exactly let me right. tell you, Greg. And we're moving forward on that. We are going to be fact-based. And uh, like I tell you, we need you on board. Let me, uh, let me go to 210. Uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, Greg, I haven't seen you in the newsroom lately. Let's do something about that, my brother. <laughs> I'll think about All it, right? brother. Thanks. All right. All right, buddy. Okay, 210. Is this my buddy John from San Antonio? Yes, it is. Been a long John, time. I haven't heard from. I've been missing you. Where have you been, my friend? Well, you know, I, I've, I've kind of had a pretty strong disagreements with you, and so, uh, you know, I, I wasn't sure if I was, uh, you know, when, when, when the right time to call you was, but uh, I decided. Let me to, stop to you listen. right there, John. John, let me stop you right there. I practice what I preach. I had a feeling that. The reason I hadn't heard from you in five or six shows is because of that. But how long have you known me? I like the disagreements, and it doesn't matter if we disagree. We have to prove that we can disagree and still communicate. I, have, I, I know you disagree a lot on, on what I've been talking about with Syria and Iraq. And you know what? That is okay. So come, continue, my dear friend. Okay. Um, I, let, me, let me first start off with, uh, you know, you've... I know you you talk about uh, civility and all that, but I mean you've been pretty harsh in your condemnation for people who don't agree with you on uh, the the situation in Syria and Iraq. Uh, you know, you, you you say things like people have been conned. Uh, they, you know, you say they that the president is acquiesced to the military industrial complex. That he's acquiesced to the neocons. He's actually asked to the Republicans. Uh, I disagree with all three of those statements. Uh, you know, he he hasn't done that. Here's what happened. I mean, he when when ISIL started gaining ground, uh, basically he saw that they were going to take over Ur Erbil. They were 30 miles outside of Erbil. We had American boots on the ground already, advisors in Erbil. He didn't want to risk them getting killed. He didn't want to have Iraq fall, uh, have Baghdad fall, all these other cities, uh, 
have have fallen. Four million people. Uh, uh, ISIS has control of four million people in Iraq. Uh, you know that 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 they actually have control over. And so, you know, I, I think that what you're saying, there's a lot of, uh, there's an incredible amount of false narrative going on that you're you're saying. And this is not about acquiescing to the military industrial complex. And, you know, I, I also don't agree with a lot of things people are saying also. I mean, I don't agree that we should be bombing Syria. I don't agree that, that people should be so frightened over beheadings. I think that's ridiculous. I think uh, that, you know, what is the difference of being beheaded uh, it, 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 when you have people, you know, hundreds of people being lined up and shot in the head – you know that's that's much worse than one person being beheaded. I think the the all the fear about beheadings and all the fear about actually attacking the homeland uh, is is terrible for the country. The the nation is is been uh, you know surrendered to fear just like they did right after 9/11. John, but can I can I can I stop you right there because it's important. Uh, you you I think you you just made the point that i have been trying to make first of all uh first of all you you gave the perfect narrative about erbil and us being run over and how to stop them from doing that okay i don't have a problem i don't have a problem with the president bombing those guys to protect the those assets i don't have a problems as uh, for a lot of what you're saying and that is why I, I wished a, 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 folks would read sort of between the lines. When I talk about being conned into war, I'm not talking about the kind of war you're talking about. I don't, there's no, by no means that I think somebody that reads as much as you do can be conned. What I, am, what, what I am actually describing is what is exactly occurring, however. We are going back on a war footing. And when I make the statements that I make about guys in a pickup truck with guns, and uh, may, you know, I am serious about that. Yes, they've captured several of the, the military equipment that we gave to Iraq. That's true. But you know what? All those things need something called resupply. And the reality is we control the resupplying of those items. Here's what drives me. When I, when I talk about the military-industrial complex, why do I use that specifically? Because you know those tanks that they stole those tanks that they stole, the, the bullets that they, the, the, the missiles that they shoot, have to be resupplied. You know all those equipments that they stole. All of that needs resupplying. You know who makes all the all the equipment to resupply that? We do. America does. The military industrial complex does make those. And what is occurring today is that they are going to be making their monies on both sides of the equation. They're going to be making their money on resupplying those guys, and they're going to make their money on shooting it down. So there are other ways that we as Americans, as the, gov the American government, could actually temper ISIS without having to go on the war footing that we're going on right now. But nobody's talking about that. Nobody no, is talking no, about they are, that. That's not, that's not true. I mean, they, they are talking about it. I mean, you, it's not it's – not I mean, you have to read a little bit deeper. I mean, you have to really put some time into it. But, I mean, people are talking about trying to cut off the funding, and this is why they're, they're also bombing the oil fields. They're bombing the oil fields in Syria. They're bombing the oil fields that, that uh, ISIS controls in Iraq, and that, that's why that's happening. I mean, you know, I, I just – I also disagree with this notion, and this is like a, such a, a strong, you know, liberal, right. and I hate to, you know, because you know I'm a, a, a strong <laughs> liberal, but I mean, there's a lot of false narratives, and one of the false narratives was just talking about before, and that is, you know, it's ISIS didn't exist, or, or Al Qaeda didn't exist before, and you know, and I mean, there's a certain amount of truth to that in Iraq, but I mean, the idea. That Wahhabism, you know, which is which is basically what uh, ISIS believes in. I mean, that that is something that has very little to do with us. I mean, anybody 
can if if your mindset is you know this is the way the world should exist and we're going to we're going to basically use violence to try to to have this happen to take over the world to create a caliphate then uh then but how can okay go ahead i don't i i, yeah, I don't look here's the issue but anyone that, who can i can I, ahead, can, I, can I? Can I? Yeah, we don't have much time. My so point ahead, is, give you much time. point is, is that this is this is from you know the culture uh, that they believe in, and so you know, let's say uh, when we got out of Iraq and there was very very few people, uh, you know, who were in Al Qaeda in, in Iraq, okay, and and then. When Syria happened, when when uh, Assad started uh, bombing uh, and and you know killing people, and the civil war w- was started in 2011, all these jihadists came in, and now they're fighting each other. There are like four or five different jihadi groups, which are basically all Wahhabists, and they're fighting each other. That's how screwed up they are. You know, yeah, they can't let me even tell you. agree. They John, can't even agree. Go ahead. We're going to have to have a long conversation on this, and you should have been calling in in the other shows so that you could, so that we could have the dialogue uh, over several shows about this. But I, I want I, I, the show is going to be coming to a close pretty soon, and I want to, uh, I, I really want to get into the meat of that, and I, I hope that we don't get into this position of, um, and when I say us, I'm talking about all the people that listen to my show. Uh, into that position about holding firm on particular grounds. Because, look, there's a whole lot that you say in, in, in the dialogue that you just provided that I agree with. But I think uh, where, where I disagree is how do we handle it? How, how does America go into action for it? I'm not at all. I cannot possibly disagree with what you said about Wahhabism, uh, Wahhabism, and I cannot possibly disagree with you when you say, well, look, a lot of this wasn't, was there before. Those are all truths, but they were truths before the first war in Iraq. There are a lot of things that were truths that are truths. The thing about it is how do we as an uh, American military handle it? And I think, believe it or not, while we may agree a whole lot on, on, on the reality, the facts on the ground, what I think we disagree with is what has to happen. I don't think I was disloyal to truth with a lot of what I said. With actually, with anything that I've said, I don't think I was disloyal to truth. Maybe I mean a, a lot of folks would say, "Well, why are you saying Khan?" I mean, the Khan doesn't apply to a John. The, uh, I mean, John actually thinks that a particular stance needs to be made. I don't. I think that um, I, I don't think certain stances should be made. But I tell you what, John, because you called in, I am going to have. A show specifically on ISIS, ISIL. I'll try to do that next week, and I'll 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 write it up and and, and do the research because I think this is some, something that we really have to get get down. One of the reasons I'm strongly opposed to the war is because of where it's going. I know I, I do not disagree with, what, what, with with the facts on the ground that you're talking about, but I think it's still a, a danger what we're actually approaching. But we only have a, a short amount of time, so I really have to hold everybody 10 seconds. So, John, give me a 10-second closer, and we'll continue this next week. Well, I mean, it's it's great to have a conversation, and I'm glad we can have this conversation because, you know, if – in a lot of countries, you can't, and I don't mean to get too cliched, but I mean that <laughs> that is the truth. Thank you very much for you know. calling in, John. You were missed, uh, Greg Rusak. The only reason we're bo- the only reason we're bombing o- overseas again is because we're a country of cowards. We're playing exactly into ISIL's hands. Thank you very much, Greg. Mike, give me a quick ten seconds. Nobody is surprised about an ISIL or somebody coming in and filling the vacuum that was going to be created no matter what we did after we left Iraq. That is a very, very important point you just made there, Mike. And I know John agrees with that. Solutions differently, however. Jack, I really got to hold you to 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, As I said, uh, Freedom of speech. That's the whole the whole issue here is freedom freedom of speech. Thank you. I got to hold you. Gotta be limited. Of thank you, yeah. sir. I gotta leave, gotta leave you there now, folks. Thank you very much for calling into the show. Um, 
we next week I am going to do better. I'm going to try to start the show a little quicker, and we'll talk about ISIS, ISIL. I have some research to do, of course, because we know John will be here. But anyway, folks, please do remember we have three different shows going right now. Press one for Democracy with Don Aronson. We have uh, that's on Mondays at 10 p.m. Eastern. On Thursdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, we have Lunch with Loudon. And on Saturdays, you're here with me, Politics Done Right with Egberto Willis. Folks, thank you very much for giving me this time. I know your time is valuable. You have a wonderful Saturday. And remember, Coffee Party on. Go sign up at coffeepartyusa.com. A wonderful day. <laughs>